Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading, and this is a silver inlaid, engraved, and carved percussion American long rifle. I picked this rifle because it has a striking resemblance to many of the original Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois long rifles that we see at the end of what we think of as kind of the American long rifles golden era. Um, although the Indiana, Ohio, Illinois guns, Michigan guns aren't necessarily seen all the time as the uh, to have the popularity or the attractiveness of some of the earlier long rifles. I think it's still fun to take a look at them and see what some of the later American long rifles, especially those with percussion locks, looked like and what made them beautiful. This rifle has seven grooved round bottom rifling with light decoration on the muzzle, traditional blade and notch sights, and silver bands with scroll engraving on the breech. The rifle is 38 caliber and features a 40 and 3 quarters inch octagon barrel. The highlight of this rifle is really the four piece patch box with piercings on each side. All around the rifle has 16 engraved silver inlays on the stock, including detailed fish on each side, crescent moons, patriotic shields, and a hunter's star inscribed with BH on the cheek piece. By the time we get to the later American long rifle, like this one, we're starting to see several things take place. For one, the rifles themselves are beginning to get smaller. When we compare this to some of the earlier American long rifles, you'll notice that this has a little bit more of a southern influence or later Pennsylvania influence. And if we were to line up early to late American long rifles, you would see an interesting transition as we shift through the time periods. It's part of the reason I like Southern styled guns is because where I'm from, by the time it was really populated, these are the kinds of long rifles and muzzleloaders that we would see. So at the back here, we have a rather narrow uh, butt stock and it's rather short as well in height and thin in thickness but we still retain the ornate patch box work like we see on many of the American long rifles. Back here you can see the two piercings on either side and then we have again two piercings at the front of our patch box here and all around this entire patch box again I said it's kind of the highlight of the rifle for me uh, we just have beautiful engraving on this piece all throughout. It does show where this rifle's been through some things, but what's really incredible to me is the carving and the engraving. It's just a fine example in my opinion. I understand I have limited experience, but it's still a nice example of a later percussion long rifle. The main lid here of our patch box features some beautiful scroll and checker pattern engraving. And that is carried through really the entire rifle. Up here on the top of our butt plate, we have some filed bands here at the top along with some diamond or triangle engraving along the facets. Rotating here so that you can see our toe plate and I'll be sure to show you um, some close-ups of this so you can get the full picture here. We can see just the incredibly narrow toe on this piece. Grabbing my ruler here, it's only about half an inch wide along the toe here. And that is pretty standard all the way up through our trigger plate here. Really narrow, once again, butt stock on this piece. We have a long brass toe plate here, about five and three quarters inches long. It starts off with a narrow rounded off point here and then goes back and steps into the full half inch width, half inch width rectangle for the entirety of the toe plate. There's a simple line engraved border all around this toe plate, but the internals of the toe plate are where we see the same kind of engraving emulated from the rest of the rifle. Coming up here to our trigger guard, since we have this oriented this way, we have again a rather narrow trigger guard lining up and accompanying the rest of this narrow rifle. The trigger guard itself features a variety of filed and engraved marks here 
a main bow of our trigger guard has some simple border engraving and then some beaver tail style half circle engravings with some shade lines around an oval here at the center. Here on the underside of our stock, we can see some of the first incised line carving on this piece. We have it kind of framing the front end of our trigger guard going back before terminating with our trigger plate at our set trigger back here. We have some beautiful incised carved curves emanating forward from our trigger guard. Again, really nice decorations, really typical decorations for an American long rifle. It's just neat to see again an original piece like this one. We do have a set trigger here and our trigger plate itself looks to be brass on first observation here. There's a little bit of a gold tint to it, but it could be iron as well. We have a curved set trigger here. It's the larger trigger in the back. And then we have a slightly curved primary trigger forward of that. And it looks like here, our trigger plate is held in with our tang bolt at the front. And then it looks to be held in with a screw back here underneath the rear curve of our trigger guard. As we flip up here, you can see the first of these engraved silver inlaid plates here that decorate the rest of the rifle. And this is really something that we see become very common in the later period long rifles, especially our Indiana, Ohio, kind of what we think of as the mid, early Midwest or the Northwest Territory for the era. Our lock plate is a rather simple percussion lock. The engraving on the percussion lock is very interesting to me. It's seen some wear. It's not nearly as defined as even the carving is on the rest of this piece, but it is in good shape, at least externally here. Uh, the engraving is interesting. We have kind of a sunburst and scroll pattern coming off of the bolster back here of our barrel. And we have some simple lines going around the edge of our face here. Our main bolt on this side features some engraving and our hammer here also has some scroll work patterns engraved into it accompanying some worn cast patterns here up towards the end. As we come back here to the tail end of our lock there are some interesting birds engraved into uh, this lock here. I say interesting because compared to other wildlife engraving or stamping even as these locks became mass produced for the time period, these birds aren't very well defined. They're kind of a, an oval body with wings and some texture. Um, but other than that, they aren't expertly done, I would say, like we see on a lot of the other engraving for this piece. It makes me wonder if the lock came you know, to the gunsmith or the assembler of all these parts um, you know, with that engraving already, if it was the kind of thing that was ordered from a shop or out of a catalog rather than made by the builder himself. Coming up to the top here, we have a rather ornate tang, tang bolt, and uh, again, bolster and breech section of this rifle. We have some beautiful scroll engraving coming off of, in each direction, our tang bolt here with simple lined borders around the outside. Around our tang here in the stock, we have a simplification of the really common beaver tail carving here that we see a lot in the American long rifle. It's interesting to compare this carving on earlier long rifles uh, that we kind of deem to be rather fancy and rather iconic for the golden age period to uh, a carving like this that can be considered to be much later for the American long rifle. It's much simpler. It's still well done. It's still beautiful, but it is done to a different degree than we see on many earlier pieces. There's some simple curved connection points here connecting our tang framed carving to our side plate and our lock plate uh, mortise carving. As we step forward into the barrel itself here, our bolster and our breech end has two rather rough silver inlaid lines at either end of our breech here. They've either been distorted with age um, or just with use. It looks like to me there is some similar engraving or stamping here on our breech and bolster assembly here but much like the lock it is worn uh, much more worn than the engraving that we see on the other extensions here through the stock 
Coming forward on our lock plate side, we can see more of these beautiful silver inlaid plates. They're held in generally with two nails or tacks through the plate and into the stock, but they are flush with the stock itself. A very common moon motif coming off of our lock plate mortise here. But then we get up here to our rear sight, and this is, let me see here, about nine inches from the rear of our bolster here. We get to our rear sight, and with this rear sight, we just have a beautiful, what looks like to be a silver trout inlaid into this piece. Uh, I love muzzle loading. I really also love fishing. Um, so it's neat to see um, those two kind of classic sportsman ideas and, and passions fused into one piece. Perhaps the person this was made for or the person who made it also enjoyed fishing alongside their sports shooting and just had to have some trout made up and applied here. Um, we assume these are trout. It looks like a trout to me. Um, I'm not an 18th century or 19th century biologist by any means though. Um, so it could be something different and we're just misnaming it. Our rear sight here is rather simple. It's set into a dovetail into the barrel. Again, another very shallow rear sight here like we see on many of these rifles. I think in a modern sense, you would compare this to a buckhorn sight but compared to a lot of the modern buckhorn sights that we see, again, very shallow, and we don't have nearly the contrast between the notch, the mid horizontal line, and then the points on either side. This whole sight, I'd say, let's look at it here with our ruler, is a quarter of an inch or less tall, and that is from the point down to the inlaid section here that is within the barrel from the barrel to the top of the sight is gonna be even less than that quarter inch. We have a rather heavy barrel all the way through on this piece. It doesn't look to me to be swamped and it is an inch or just a hair over an inch wide from side to side. So it is a heavy barrel on this piece, but it's interesting as we see the guns age and as they transition west, we see heavier barrels and smaller calibers applied to many of these. That's not to say that that is an exclusivity, but it is something that we see to be very common. Jumping forward of our trout here, we have our ramrod entry pipe on the underside of our stock. Again, a simple thin brass entry pipe here. Accompanying our brass entry pipe though, is some beautiful incised line scroll carving that transitions into some in incised line carving that follows along the entirety of the forestock and the ramrod channel. Now, we don't have any um, texture or really any depth to our ramrod channel carving here. It's just these simple lines that have been darkened with age, contrasting what I believe to be a curly maple stock here. This is a rather light curly maple stock. It's kind of reddish or orange in tint, so we can still see a lot of that variation. And Really, I think this incised line carving here at our entry pipe is kind of the teaser to what we'll talk about a little bit later on our cheek piece. As I said, we have three ramrod pipes and our ramrod entry pipe back here. Each of the forward pipes is held in with, I believe, to be one pin. The pins themselves, some of them look to be brass, um, like here on our entry pipe. It looks like we have a couple brass nails maybe that have been subbed in for the original pins. But as we move forward here, the other pins seem to be recessed into the stock and darker than brass. You'll notice that we don't have a pipe all the way out here at the front. It's set back probably about four inches from the nose here before we get to our first on our side plate side now, we have a, a duplication really of the forestock down to the style and the layout of the carving here at our entry pipe. This carving is very similar on both sides and the engraving is nearly identical on our inlays, even down to the trout. Uh, the trout on either side, uh, there are mirror images of each other nearly. I wanna note too that we do have a couple fractures or blowouts uh, aligning with some barrel pins on this stock. And I bring that up not to um, discredit or, or devalue this piece in any way. It's very common for us to see that. But I wanna bring that up as a notion um, 
for why I don't take the barrel pins out very often on my pieces. You can be very careful, but accidents can happen. And we see that from time to time on an original piece like this. So that's something to consider with your contemporary muzzleloaders today. As we come back here to our side plate mortise, you can see we have a beautifully uh, inlaid brass piece here. It's scrolled and rather flowing from front to back. We have two screws on the lower end here of our side plate. We have our main lock bolt going through the top here. We have a piece of wire attached here that I don't feel is original, but I do want to make a note of that. So if you see it, you don't think that you're crazy. Our side plate is beautifully engraved. The engraving matches the engraving that we see on the rest of the inlaid pieces here, um, not the lock plate, just to note there. And we do have a nice window in our side plate here, exposing more of that curly maple grain. The lock and side plate mortises here around the stock are defined really by dark incised lines. There's not a whole lot of contrast in regards to definition here from our side plate down to the rest of our stock. It does look worn, but I do believe that uh, a lot of the definition was kind of faked in with those incised lines uh, to give this the appearance that it was more ornately carved than it actually was. And that is something that stylistically we see as long rifles change. Like we talked about the beaver tail on the tang, um, similar things happen with our mortise carving through the time period. We start to see accents being made with these incised lines that are then darkened instead of um, depth in the carving as we move through time. And that is really emulated as we step back here to our cheek piece. And it's um, you know in conjunction with, again, our entry pipe carving that we've talked about up here. Jumping back to our cheek piece here, it's really, apart from the patch box, the, really the part of this rifle that sings to me. As we come off of our wrist, we start some beautiful scroll and checker carving here. Then as we go underneath our cheek piece, it's again just beautifully carved. Uh, but once again, like the, unlike the Golden Age era long rifles, where we see a lot of contrast in the depth of this carving, much of this carving here is done with simple incised lines. There is some variance in definition, but it's not to the degree that we see in other eras of long rifles. You'll notice back here that we really start to see the change in depth as we get back to behind our cheek piece here, where these scrolls and checkerboards begin to separate themselves from the rest of the stock. And this is just a really wonderful outline for you to reference and think about when considering carving and decorating or, or studying of these long rifles. Because unlike a lot of the other carving on this piece that has been worn, this carving back here is still very clean. The light definition and change of plane here in our cheek rest was enough to protect a lot of this carving from being worn over the years and it's really just come out to be just beautiful. Again, it's a different era of American long rifle than we see in kind of the earlier periods, but I think its execution is still just very nicely done and, and serves as a great reference point for us for kind of percussion age long rifles. Many times we kind of think of, we have the American long rifle and then we have kind of the Plains, Rocky Mountain fur trade rifles, and then we're into smokeless. Um, you know, firearms and things. But we did have quite a long period of time, especially east of the Mississippi, where we had percussion long rifles that were still beautiful and still ornate, and still carried over some of those early American arms traditions and applications. Sadly on this piece, we don't have any maker's marks. The only signs of, uh, of initials really are back here on this hunter's star or a star of Bethlehem as some will call it back here above the cheek piece. This is engraved and inlet as a piece of silver here. And much like the rest of the inlets on this piece, I 
consider it to be rather well done. It's flush with the wood. We have a little bit of wood shrinkage around these inlets, but it's not nearly to the degree that I don't think it would even catch a beard hair if I were to shoot this piece on the range. That's all I have for you on this piece. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company and their team here for giving me the opportunity to share this piece with you. Like I said, because I'm from an area where we have these original pieces as kind of some of the early pioneers were carrying, uh, it's always really neat to see another example of them, especially with the ornate decoration like this one has. Like I said, the trout combined with the muzzle loading is a really neat thing to see. And I'm really excited that we were able to take a look at a piece like this one. And I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. If you'd like to see some up close photographs and some measurements from this piece, I'll have some more photos and things at ilovemuzzleloading.com. It will be the first link in the description where you can find out some more details about this piece. And I also encourage you to check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages if you're interested in seeing more original and antique arms. The team here produces some wonderful content that uh, educates and displays the, these original pieces. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.